The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Forever in Glory by Richard Jensen from his album Worship. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on or about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome back to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, we will begin part three and the conclusion of the Bible, a message from God to man. By way of review, beginning in the previous episodes, part one and two, we took up the challenge to conduct a summary overview of the Bible to determine its veracity, reliability, and authenticity. We began the discussion with the three possibilities which were proposed regarding the Bible. One, The Bible is a series of stories and or events which are myths, fables, make-believe, which are completely false or lies. Two, the Bible is filled with stories, events, and information with which we do not have enough information to know whether or not as a whole the Bible is reliable or not. Or three, the Bible is accurate and reliable. When we initiated our study of the Bible, I suggested an approach to the understanding of the integrity, veracity, and reliability of the Bible in terms of the acrostic tape. By reminder, the acrostic tape is analogous to four legs or pillars of a stool. We found that in examining T, which stands for the textual integrity of the Bible, that there were various issues commonly raised by the skeptics and critics. Namely, one of those issues was that the New Testament contains some 200,000 errors in comparing 5,600 texts and manuscripts. In contrast to the insinuation created by quoting the number 200,000 errors out of context, we examined the current publishing standards of the average novel as compared to the completed New Testament. In doing so, we discovered that if the New Testament were written today, using today's advanced technology, with today's optimal conditions, and allowing for a 1% error rate, which is considered, quote, rare and exceptional, unquote, we would have a New Testament written today containing approximately 38,640,000 errors. Instead, we have a completed New Testament today written 2,000 years ago without advanced technology, and without optimal conditions, which according to skeptics has 200,000 errors. Secondly, we found that the errors, quote-unquote, are in fact variants, which translates to differences in many cases of simple periods, commas, or punctuation and grammar errors. There are no variants which affect the theological meaning and understanding of the texts contained in these 200,000 errors. 
Next we had the complaint that the New Testament was written so long after the events that it is impossible to have reliability or accuracy as to the events being portrayed. Well, in answer to that, we found that the New Testament is not only equal to, but far it again surpasses any pieces of literature written before, during, or after the time of the New Testament. Second, the allegation or insinuation that the New Testament and or the Bible is somehow untrustworthy or unreliable due to having been written so long ago after the original events carries no more merit than saying evolution or cosmological science books are unreliable or untrustworthy due to having been written too long after the original events. Another criticism was that the New Testament was in the hands of the church as a result, we have no way of being assured that they have not been deletions, insertions, or changes by zealous persons. Well, firstly, we saw no credible evidence to support the charge that the church or any other person altered the Bible in an intentional, demonstrable, and unscrupulous way. Second, the allegation or insinuation that the Bible is unreliable due to having been accessible to the early church carries no more weight or merit than making the allegation that science books are unreliable due to having been in the hands of scientists. Lastly, we had the contention that the New Testament contains contradictions with itself and or with the Old Testament. In answer to that, we found that the New Testament and the Bible as a whole has apparent contradictions, most if not all of which are resolved by exercising proper translation, using proper context and understanding of the culture of the time, using proper exegesis as opposed to eisegesis, and remembering that the Bible uses different methods, genres, and narratives, and lastly, allowing for occasional scribal human error. As a whole, we found that in examining A, the archaeological integrity of the Bible, we discovered that rather than having myths, stories, and legends with little or no historical evidence for support, instead we find tangible empirical evidences from archaeology matching the Bible in specificity. We find time after time the Bible is an accurate and reliable historical record which details who, what, when, and where real people, places, and things occurred. We found that in examining P, the prophetical integrity of the Bible, we discovered that rather than the Bible being written by superstitious shepherds steeped in myths and legends, the Bible records details of events in great detail, written many hundreds of years before they happened, and yet which are fulfilled with great mathematical precision and accuracy. Inevitably, one must ask how is it possible for numerous fallible humans to predict things and events dozens, if not hundreds of years before the events happened, without the advantage of inspiration from a supreme being who knows everything revealing the future events to them. We found that in examining E, the evidence of lives changed, that the Bible has consistently been the reason for positive change in people's lives throughout history, more than any other piece of literature on earth. The only explanation for such effectiveness is the divine inspiration and power endowed by God himself through his spirit. If we apply the acrostic tape to any other human literature, it might be possible to find contenders which fit one requirement, perhaps in rare cases two, but few if any can deliver on all four criterion. Fewer still can continue to so powerfully achieve so much for so long despite the greatest assaults from skeptics ever mounted. That being said, how do we answer the question first posed regarding the three possibilities of the Bible? Well, first of all, let's examine option A, i.e. the Bible is completely false and an erroneous book. The fact is that when we examine all of the various textual archaeological, prophetical aspects, as well as the reality of the evidence of changed lives, we must confess that with all intellectual honesty, 
that the Bible is not a completely false and erroneous book since there are some empirical evidences which we found from the survey of our acrostic tape to substantiate the Bible's authenticity. Thus, option A must be eliminated as a viable option. Two, since option A is untenable, we must, after receiving the least corroboration of veracity, begin with option B. The Bible is filled with stories, events, and information with which we do not have enough information to know whether or not, as a whole, the Bible is reliable or not. Minimally, this is the intellectually neutral position. But what of option C? The Bible is reliable and trustworthy as to what it says. Many think that they know of any number of reasons why option C cannot possibly be correct. For example, we might come up with the excuse often posed, A. Look at how many scientists and intellectually intelligent people there are who don't believe. Surely this is an indication that while I may not be sure or know, they must. Well, for one, percentage and consensus do not equate to truth or reality. They only relay opinion by the numbers. Two, scientists and the secular have just as much ability to exercise bias and prejudice as do anyone else. Another reason, many other people think that they know one of the reasons why the Bible cannot possibly be correct is to say to themselves, I'm not satisfied making such a critically important life-changing decision as this without having absolute 100% personal proof with my own eyes. Well, firstly, personal proof would eliminate the possibility of any historical event before you were born, after you die, or when you are not physically present to see those events. Two, being personally present would not eliminate the possibility to claim personal bias prejudice, confusion, mistake, or even hallucination. A third option many people think that they know is a reason why that the Bible cannot possibly be correct is that they reason to themselves, I have too many personal investments and personal relationships at present which would suffer by making such a change. I'll wait until circumstances are more favorable. Well, first of all, we all need to remember that tomorrow is guaranteed to no man. 2. Predicating correct choices on the presence of perfect feelings and or perfect environmental factors can and will likely preclude making any choice which involves change. Now, to further address the answer to the question, is the Bible reliable and trustworthy? Let me remind the listener that earlier I made six points in opening. Let me quickly review those points. Point 1. The Bible ultimately presents itself as a revelation of God's Word. That is to say that the various books and texts are intended to be a message from God the Creator to man, His creation. As such, it is logical that working backwards by studying the Bible we should be able to find and understand that message which is intended for us. Point 2. Creation, i.e. all that was, including man's relationship to God, began initially in perfection by result of God's hand. Shortly thereafter, all creation, including man's relationship to God, was and remains warped and damaged by the effects of man's choice to rebel, sin, against God. Point 3. Since the effects of sin presently exist, man can and should expect that sin and all of its attributes will affect our approach to and our understanding of everything, including our approach and understanding of the Bible, as well as our relationship to God. Point 4. If point 1 is true, we expect and predict that God will include some methodology, mechanism, or information built into His Word, or His general revelation of Himself, whereby honest and sincere men and women can be assured the message received is intact. Point 5. If point 2 and 3 are true, we expect and predict that God will, at some point, work within his creation to create a mechanism whereby his mercy, man, can find the power or ability to overcome our condition and effect of sin and return to a relationship with God. 
0.6. Lastly, we would expect that like any information given by design and purpose, the Bible will ultimately present a uniform and integral message. And we suggested that in that strain that there was perhaps no greater overall proposed theme than that of John chapter 20, verse 31, which says, quote, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name, unquote. Now you will recall that I mentioned there would be three points in addition to the above six at the conclusion of this presentation. I also mentioned that there would be one final point which would take the form of a prediction at the conclusion. Here they are. Point one. Not everyone is going to respond to the offer of salvation. Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 say this, quote, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it." Unquote. Jesus concludes in verse 21 saying, quote, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Unquote. Thus we can conclude that since only quote, a few unquote, find life or enter heaven, that likely that same few will open their heart and believe God's word. Point two, we cannot hope to understand God or his word fully without his help. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 tells us why. Quote, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Unquote. Point three. The Bible reveals not only the truth and reality that God exists, but also that we face an adversary, Satan, who contends against God and mankind in various manners. Point four. We made the observation that the Bible ultimately presents a uniform and integral message and revelation summarized by John chapter 20, verse 31. Again, quote, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name, unquote. The conclusion which I predicted earlier is this. There will be those, regrettably, who will not believe. There are those who will look at all of the evidence and despite all say, quote, show me proof, unquote, or, quote, I will not believe unless I see it with my own eyes, unquote. There are those who say today, what others said when Jesus himself walked the earth, quote, show me a sign, unquote. As a result, we live with the reality that for some, no amount of data, evidence, documents, proof, or miracles will ever suffice. This is ultimately because proof is really not the issue. The issue is trust, which deals with the heart. We must remember the following when considering the Bible. A. The Bible, and ultimately God, are not solely interested in exclusively transforming the human intellect to academic agreement to itself. Instead, from the outset until the outcome, God and the Bible are primarily concerned with transforming and renewing the spirit and the heart to faith, which by His grace reconciles the believer to God. B. While the intellect is involved in the process, it is faith in the Bible's ultimate message of reconciliation by His grace which completes the process of restoration. C. Restoration requires and necessitates repentance from rebellion against God and submission to God. And finally, D. Repentance and submission flow from our acceptance of the reality of our current moral, ethical, and spiritual inability and depravity on our own to be reconciled to God. In the ultimate analysis, the Bible is the final catalyst for the heart of man. Somewhere within the mystery of God's economy, the Bible, the truth of God's message, his plan and offer of redemption, 
serves to either soften, convict, and transform the heart, and ultimately the spirit of man, or it serves to progressively harden the heart of man to the point of no return. As we close, you can choose to look at the stool, if you will, and its four legs and adopt a skeptical attitude and a hardened heart to say, a la the matrix, there is no stool, or I don't believe, or you can choose to exercise faith and find rest in God's word, the Bible. Father, as we close this series, we thank you for the time and the energy that you give us to listen and to obey your word, to study your word, and to comprehend what it is that you are saying in your message. Lord, we know from a study of your word that your spirit is constantly searching the heart of man to find faith. And we pray that as your spirit is searching even now, that you would find faith and that you would pour out your spirit your blessing upon that faith, and help it to grow. We pray that your Spirit would help us to put aside all doubt, all unbelief, all hardness of heart, and all other things which preclude us from believing in the things that you have given us, Lord. We ask you to help us with our unbelief, and to give us the faith that we need to believe. And I ask now that this series would go forth, and would bless many. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Now, if you have any questions with regard to this series or any other series, or in fact, if you have an unrelated question regarding the Bible, God, the Christian faith, I would invite you to please send a brief question to me at Pastor Yeshua, that's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. I look forward to any questions you may have and hope to see you again soon.